In this video, we're talking about finasteride, and we're talking about it in the context of BPH, prostatitis, and prostate cancer. So Dr. Mark Scholes, who's a 30-year medical oncologist focusing solely in prostate cancer and prostate issues, is going to give us some context of how this drug is used and where you can apply it. So in today's video, we're talking about finasteride, and we're talking about it in the context of BPH, prostatitis, and prostate cancer. So to give kind of a bigger picture, a lot of men who deal with prostate cancer also deal with these other issues, so we thought we would do a video combining them. Now, can you explain what finasteride is? Finasteride is a pill, it's been on the market for 30 years, that selectively blocks a potent form of testosterone called DHT, inside the prostate, which is a really cool phenomenon because we don't want to block testosterone throughout the whole body because men rely on testosterone for their libido and their energy and uh, muscle growth, all kinds of uh, attractive things. If you could block testosterone inside the prostate so that when it enlarges, you can reverse that, uh, it can uh, lower PSA levels, it can improve urine flow and, and uh, other desirable things. Uh, without having the repercussions of losing muscle and libido, which is a pretty cool accomplishment. When it comes to the prostate, you know, testosterone is the component that is making it grow larger. And the concept is that if you have BPH or prostatitis, you know, it's giving off a lot more PSA. So how would you say finasteride works in res when it comes to PSA? The prostate manufactures PSA. PSA is an enzyme that uh, takes white semen and turns it into clear semen. And uh, that enzymatic action uh, is uh, a component of the whole sexual process. But PSA being unique to the prostate allows us to measure PSA that's leaked into the bloodstream and it's proportionate to how big the prostate is or how inflamed the prostate is, or if there's a prostate cancer, how much prostate cancer is present. And that's proven to be a very useful metric throughout the years for screening and for monitoring uh, disease uh, processes. Blockade of DHT shuts down the prostate cancer cells and they manufacture less PSA as a result. So PSA levels uh, will drop in the bloodstream, which is reflective of the fact that either the prostate is shrinking or the prostate has become less active and is producing less, um, less semen and producing less PSA. Before I get to my next question, this September, we are having our in-person Prostate Cancer Patients and Caregivers Conference here in Los Angeles, and we would love to see you there. You can find out more at PCRI.org. Also, click that subscribe button. When you do this, it tells the YouTube platform that this video was helpful for you, and they'll push our videos out to other people who need them. And if you would like to donate and join our cause, you can do so at PCRI.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Scholes. So within the context of prostate cancer then, how does something like finasteride work when someone's on active surveillance or is thinking about it because maybe they have this larger PSA and how should PSA act when you're on active surveillance? Because PSA has been such a central part of the prostate cancer world for so long, uh, people tend to think of it as a, a central component of active surveillance, which is monitoring low-grade prostate cancer. And we still do uh, order PSA tests, but the underlying um, methodology for uh, checking men with low-grade cancers is to either do uh, MRI imaging, which I prefer, or many doctors do periodic biopsies and rely less heavily on PSA. Nevertheless, we still check PSAs on active surveillance, and when they run higher than we expect, it makes people nervous. High PSAs often aren't due to cancer. They're often due to a big prostate or they're due to inflammation, so-called prostatitis, but in the context of someone having been diagnosed with prostate cancer, that higher PSA makes people very nervous. Finasteride can fulfill a useful role in handling that problem because PSA levels typically will not decline in people that have a consequential cancer, but they will decline if people have prostatitis or an enlarged gland. As long as people don't get side effects from finasteride, and we can go into that in a minute, uh, it's a kind of a nice phenomenon to have PSAs drop down to uh, lower, uh, more normal levels in men that have BPH or prostatitis. And studies have shown that rising PSAs in people that are on finasteride are a more accurate indication of a cancer problem than rising PSAs in people that aren't taking 
finasteride because of all the background noise from prostatitis and BPH. So we have a lot of men who have these, you know, correlating issues where maybe they even have maybe two of them or all three. Do you suggest that all men kind of go on a finasteride or something like it? Or is there a reason that a man shouldn't go on it in order to get that baseline level of what the prostate size is? Right. The men that wouldn't even consider this are the ones that are already r running low PSA levels and don't have enlarged prostate urinary symptom. Uh, problems, uh, but finasteride can't be used as a panacea because of one main problem, and that is in a certain percentage of people, and it's a little ambiguous, maybe one out of three men, it uh, can seriously impair sex drive. I'm not talking about the ability to get erections, you know, with Viagra and Cialis and whatnot, that's called potency, but libido or sex drive oftentimes will be impaired if you block uh, DHT, which is the potent form of testosterone that finasteride blocks. I uh, councilmen who are running high PSAs and who are considering finasteride to be aware of the fact that they may notice that they're losing interest in sexual activity. And if they consider that to be a negative thing, as many people do, then they need to stop the pill. But many men can take these medicines and it doesn't affect them that way. It's also FDA approved to make your hair grow more thickly, which is uh, considered desirable by some people. So there's a lot of good things, but the one caveat is you gotta watch out for low libido. So for that one third of men who do encounter this issue where they have the lower libido, is there an alternative medication they can take or is it just they have to get off the medication? There's no dose regulation or anything that can change? You can experiment with cutting the dose. The medicine can be effective at lower doses, uh, but oftentimes, that will not solve the problem. Some men are sensitive to it in that regard, and they'll have to go off it. If we had another medicine that was uh, good at suppressing benign causes of high PSA, um, we'd be using that too. I'm not aware of one. We've done some research with different investigational agents. We haven't found a good alternative. So uh, typically you just stop the medicine, uh, its effects wear off, and the, and the libido returns. How long does it take for the effects to wear off? Well, it depends on how long men have been taking it. There are actually lawsuits. This medicine was FDA approved under the name of Propecia to it, enhance hair growth, and uh, men would take it for extended periods, this, a percentage of men, and then when they stopped it, perhaps after taking it for many years, they didn't see the return of their libido, and so there have been some lawsuits against the pharmaceutical companies for not uh, warning them about this. The return of libido in men that have taken it for, let's say, a, a month or two while they're testing the waters and stop it, you know, soon thereafter, 100% of the time, libido will return in, you know, within a month or so. It's not a problem for people who are aware of it and stop the medicine in a timely fashion, but it can be a problem for people that take it year after year after year and then stop it. They may be uh, dealing with a, a persistent low libido thereafter. So besides low libido, what other side effects are associated with finasteride? Not much. Anytime uh, testosterone is modulated in any fashion, occasionally that extra testosterone will get turned into estrogen. So I think about 1% of men can get some tenderness or enlargement of their uh, nipples. That can be blocked with estrogen blocking medicines or stopping the medicine. But for the most part, it's a very benign medicine that uh, you can take with or without food and does not interact with other medications. So what is the typical dose of finasteride for a patient and does it vary between prostatitis, BPH, and prostate cancer? So for those three, the typical dose is five milligrams a day, but people can start at a lower dose and, and escalate if they want. Uh, for the hair enhancement, they use one milligram a day. So when it comes to urinary flow, we have medications like Flomax or Merbetric. How does finasteride compare? Well, one thing I counsel people when they're considering a finasteride or Proscar, same thing, to try and help uh, you know, reduce urinary urgency, getting up at night and slow urinary flow issues that happen as men get older, uh, is to be a little more patient. Medicines like Flomax and Merbetric, which have a different mechanism of action than Proscar does, work very quickly. And people will know within a few days if that medicine is enhancing their quality of life or not and they can make a decision. Medicines that block testosterone uh, rely on the sh slow shrinkage of the prostate that occurs when testosterone levels are, are dropped to a lower level, and that can take a couple months. So if people do decide to uh, avail themselves of a trial of finasteride to en enhance urine flow and function, they need to give it a little more time. If it's successful, it may take a couple months before you notice a difference. Something I've read about finasteride, and Dr. Moyad and Dr. Cooperberg also talked about this in a previous video, which we can link in the description below, is that there was a black box warning with it. So can you explain to the patients what a black box warning is and how this applies to something like finasteride? Yeah, so after a medicine gets FDA approved, sometimes further research discloses 
potential issues or side effects that uh, the FDA puts forth as a possible concern or a danger associated with a medicine. And that's what a black box warning is. And there is one, if you look in the books where they talk about all these medicines, the, there's a warning that uh, finasteride may uh, cause higher grade cancers. And this was an early observation that when men uh, were on finasteride, they seemed to find more high grade cancers. The reason that that's the case is pretty logical. What happens, finasteride shrinks the prostate, and the way we find cancers is by sticking the prostate a dozen times, which is a standardized approach. If you wanted to make it fair, you'd stick bigger prostates 20 times and little prostates six times, and you'd get the same spread of needles. But the methodology that's used is everyone just gets 12 sticks, whether the big prostate's big or small. And uh, you could see how if men had smaller prostates, which is what finasteride does, you're more likely to find the cancer because you have a smaller target and you're using the same number of cores. So this phenomenon was observed early on and people hypothesized that this is the reason for it, but the FDA said, well, we can't be sure. Maybe finasteride is causing these high-grade cancers. Longitudinal studies have subsequently showed that no, that is in no way the case. It, uh, but I don't know if the FDA has a mechanism for getting rid of black box warnings. This was put on the medication uh, list maybe 25 years ago. So. Uh, there is no evidence whatsoever that finasteride causes high-grade cancers, but if you look it up online, you'll find there's a warning to that effect. One of the things about prostate cancer is that, you know, we have these different types of treatments, but a lot of it for men, they deal with the mental toll of thinking that they may be taking a hormone therapy. Is this considered a hormone therapy like we typically think of hormone therapy treatments? And if so, um, how does it compare side effect wise? Because it sounds like it doesn't have as many side effects. It is very different. And, you know, can you contextualize that for us? Well, I'd say in the third of men that we were referring to previously who lose their libido. That's very typical of hormone therapy. And uh, things like Lupron and Orgovix and Extandi and these other testosterone blocking agents. The notable muscle loss that you can see in typical hormone treatments that, such as those I've mentioned uh, is uh, not gonna happen with finasteride. But loss of libido, yes. And so uh, that is something to be aware of. Uh, finasteride doesn't have any anti-cancer horsepower, it can suppress low-grade prostate cancers, which one would argue don't even need to be suppressed because they're harmless, but it doesn't have any true anti-cancer effect against the more uh, consequential cancers. So other than being aware of the fact that libido can be suppressed, it doesn't have a lot of similarities with other types of hormone therapy, even though it does have a, a hormonal mechanism of action by blocking the development of DHT, which is a more potent form of testosterone. What's the typical duration you've seen a patient stay on finasteride? When men don't have any side effects from uh, finasteride, which is more than half the men, uh, they can remain on the medicine indefinitely for many years. Uh, the prostate shrinking effect will linger after the medicine is stopped for an extended period of time, possibly for a few years, due to the mechanism of action, which the regrowth of the prostate when finasteride is removed is going to take a while. I think men that find that it's effective tend to remain on it for an extended period of time. If you're thinking about taking finasteride or you're on finasteride, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is talk to your doctor about your concerns ahead of time. If libido is a big concern for you, go ahead and bring that up. One of the things that we see in prostate cancer is that men don't speak up for themselves. They don't advocate for themselves. And that's why I'm here at PCRI so passionate about all of you, because I want you to speak up. I want you to take care of your quality of life. I want you to take care of your emotional health, your mental health, because you're a human experiencing issues in a very intimate and private way. And because it's intimate and because it's private, dealing with urinary flow and sexuality, oftentimes men just let it go by silently when there are options that may be able to help them. Quality of life is so important, so please take care of yourself. We care here at PCRI. I care. And I want you to be able to get your questions answered and have a shared decision-making experience with your doctor. So bring up your concerns, whether that's mental concerns, whether that's physical concerns, and even write them down in a journal, whether that's on your phone or in physical paper, or even telling somebody, maybe a friend or a partner or a support group leader. All of these things add so that you have a better experience in dealing with any of the issues that you may be encountering.
Now, if you need help or support, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients who give you information, not advice. But what they do is help contextualize prostate cancer information so that you can go into your doctor's appointments knowing with confidence that these are my questions, this is the research that I've done, and hear what your medical team has to say about it for your particular case. If you would like more information, also you can visit our website at pcri.org. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And please remember, most of all, you're not alone.